the hotel industry is easily thought about in in two buckets. You have owners and you have operators. Sometimes there's a mix between those two. No, sorry, three buckets. Owners, operators, and franchises. Can't forget the franchises. Uh, and, it, and, and sometimes you get the, the same between owner and operator. I'll talk about that. But typically owners, operators, franchises. And they are three separate and distinct uh, groups. So let's take... Let me talk about how a luxury hotel and then how a you know limited service hotel. There's there's some nuances, but I think they'll actually um, you know be able to highlight the differences between the two and, and between the, and between the, how the different buckets work. So let's say you own a you know select service hotel in you know, Houston, Texas, uh, and and when I say you as the owner, I mean you own the land and the building, right? You own the land and the building and all the stuff inside the building, right? Um, when you when you when you go to buy that hotel. There are two things that you're thinking about um, in terms of, of the industry and how it's structured. One is what franchise should I have that hotel in? So top, typically, you'll start, if you sign up a franchise agreement, common franchise agreements for 15 to 20 years. So let's say I sign a franchise agreement with Hilton. And it's okay, Hilton, I'm buying this hotel. I want it to be a Hilton hotel. Uh, you know, you pay your $150,000 to do the fee to even you know, apply to be a Hilton franchisor. And you go through the process. And they vet you and they look at your balance sheet and you have to submit personal financial statements and you know all that kind of stuff. And they say, okay, you know, we will let you sign a franchise for, let's say it's a Hilton Garden Inn. So you sign, okay, great. So Hilton is the franchisor. I own the building and the land and everything on top of it. And what that agreement between me and Hilton is, is basically for every dollar that I make, we're gonna split it with you at some at some percentage. And it it differs a little bit, and there's some negotiation room here, but Pretty common is to assume that basically about nine cents, about nine percent of every dollar that you make is going to go to Hilton. So if I make you know a million dollars from the hotel, then ninety thousand is going to Hilton. That just happens on a, on a on a typically monthly basis. That's basically what the franchise fee is there. And there's the franchise fee comes from franchise fee directly, and then a marketing fee and a couple other things. But on on general, somewhere between to be eight, eight to ten percent of every dollar you make in return. Hilton does a couple of things for you. One is you put your name up there, right? You can have the Hilton names. So people driving by see it. You know, I want to stay there. I'm a Hilton Honors member and you know, I'm going to go in there. The other thing that they do, though, that's really important is they handle all the booking, backend marketing for you. So when you go to book on the Hilton website, you go to Hilton.com and you're looking for a hotel in Houston, Texas, and you put in, you know, how many people you're staying with, how many rooms you're going to be there and all that kind of stuff. You know, our hotel is going to be on there. The pictures are on there. They handle all the back-end software. All of those costs are covered by Hilton through that franchise fee. So that's a, that's a really, really big one. That's you know, the main reason why owners of land and hotels want something like to enter into a franchise agreement with, with a company like Hilton or Marriott. The, other, the, the, the last thing that I think is kind of I, I, the big things that franchise does is they, they make sure that all of their franchisees are keeping their hotels up to date with the standards that Hilton produces. So the whole idea behind a franchise, right? This is true for hospitality, but also for you know McDonald's and, and everything and every other company, is that you have predictability because of the franchise name. So I know that if I get a spicy chicken sandwich from McDonald's in California, it's gonna taste the same basically as the one in Florida, as the one in you know Chicago and, and so on. And Hilton has the same thing with rooms. They say, look, I don't want someone to come to stay at a Hilton Garden Inn in you know New York. And then, you know, it's all, it's nice and they have, you know, two queens and they have the 55 inch room and they have the, you know, the bathroom and the, uh, the, the shower tub combo. And then I go to one in, you know, Phoenix and they have, you know, 80s carpets and, you know, there's no TV and I don't get breakfast. And so Hilton makes sure that all the brand, all the, all of you who own Hilton hotels you know, are staying at the same standards and you have to refresh it every seven years or 14 years. So that's why you would enter into a franchise agreement. That's what the franchise role plays. You know, if you're not updating your hotel on that basis and you still have your 80s carpet, you know, then you can, then they can talk about pulling the franchise and there's some, you know, there's some, some consequences that you don't want in order to, to keep the Hilton name on there. So that's the owner, you know, owns the land, owns the building, owns everything inside of it. And the franchisor who has the name on the building and helps you with the marketing. Then you have the operator. The operator is the person who trains, hires, you know, keeps the employment of pay the payroll, all that for every single person inside that hotel, right? So all the workers. So for example, you might have an operator that I say, look, I, you know, I don't know anything about hotels. I want to hire someone to run the hotel. This person will come in and they'll say, okay, great. 
to, to average cost for this about 3% of room revenue. First, they say, look, I'll manage the hotel for you, meaning I will hire the GM, I'll train them on how to, you know, do all the accounting processes and, and train, I'll train housekeepers and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be sure that they know how to fold the towels in the correct, you know, Hilton and Marriott way, all of those kind of things. I'll run the day-to-day, I'll fire people if I need to hire, I'll, um, you know, be sure that we're checking people in, we're saying the right things, right? When you, when you get checked in, you should, should mention their reward status and you should, you know, uh, say, you know, Mr. or Mrs. name and, you know, all those kind of things that Hilton and Marriott and the franchise cares about and also the guests care about, that's all done by the operator. The operator also will go and do sales and say, hey, I'll have a sales team and we're going to go out and we're going to find out, you know, uh, from our local chamber of commerce, there's four new buildings being built down the road. We want those guys to come work, um, come stay with us when they're traveling or when they are hosting. And they do, they do all, all the work that it takes to run a hotel is done by the operator. Now, on the limited service side, the owner can also be the operator. It's a little bit easier to do that. You apply and you still got to go through and you got to show that you have a team who knows hotels and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and you can get it approved. So you can operate it yourself as well. You can be the owner and the operator, which is what we do for all of our hotels, except for the five-star luxury hotels. Five-star luxury hotels are only worldwide managed by the brand themselves. So Waldorf, every single Waldorf, both in the United States and overseas, is managed by Hilton. Every single Ritz-Carlton, managed by Marriott. You know, every single, uh, those, um, uh, uh, the Intercontinental, right, managed by IHE. So you have those, you have those brands and they manage it themselves and they don't let anyone else manage them. You can still manage the other hotels. You can manage the JW, if you really get approved for it, you can manage full service hotels, but, um, as a as a as an operator, you cannot manage five star luxury uh, resort and hotels. That's only by the brand. But those are those are the three buckets: owner, operator, franchise. Sometimes you get owner operator. We think that it's really important to have owner operator together because the operator they make their money three percent typically off of room revenue, top line. So if you think about it from an operator's perspective, what is what is their incentive? Their incentive is to drive room revenue, not necessarily profitability. You might sometimes get a little bonus, you know, kicker, but typically the bulk of their, the way that a, a hotel management company, hotel operator makes money is off of top line. So think about it, you know, they're, they're going to be incentivized to say, hey, let's let everyone who walks in, let's give them a glass of champagne or a golden towel or, you know, just drive people into the hotel and book rooms and charge, you know, and, and make the top line. Who cares about profitability? And so as an owner, you have to be really careful about how you use third party operators um, and how and how they think about the incentives and how they're incentivized, how their bonus structure works, what kind of approval rights you have, all those kind of things are really, really, really important ways that owners can still keep in hand on hotels that they do not operate themselves. The boutique hotels are mainly run by third-party operators, uh, especially if they're kind of um, you know tricky on, on 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 you know. For example, we, we looked at one in in the. Um, Red, like Redwood, uh, Yellowstone, you know, that kind of area in Northern California. And in order to run the hotel correctly, you had to really know like the amenities that was available, you know, in those areas and figure out, you know, all that kind of stuff. But in terms of like normal hotels, like Fairfields and all that kind of stuff, um, your limited service hotels, the ones that you drive by the freeway all the time, and there's, you know, eight right there sitting there. I would say that probably about 50 to 60% of those are going to be run by owner operators. This is the, the and then another half of that are run by third party, you know, specialists. Um, companies. Typically what happens is as a company gets really big, they'll then turn it over to a third-party management company. So they'll say, and that's that's only because you, know, you can manage maybe one or two or three hotels yourself with your team. But once you start getting into, uh, you know, 10 hotels or 12 or 13 hotels, you're talking about, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of employees, dozens of, 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 of managers. That is a full-time job, just, you know, managing the regional manager who, you know, kind of like it starts to get more layers and that's a full-time thing. And so we, our, our company does manage our own hotels. We have about a dozen now, but we have a whole team that we built out there, right? We have a former director of Marriott who's who's running that team and, and he has team members and accounting folks and it's a whole thing that he does. Um, but we do, you know, that is our company. We still own it. We, we oversee it. We have a team that helps us um, actually day to day. When, when you are an owner and you have a third-party operator, say, for example, for a Waldorf or, or a Ritz, where, especially it's the brand, your job is really, you know, falls into, starts to fall into asset management. And so the levers that you have are a couple fold. One is you still get to approve all of the CapEx. So all CapEx still comes through, usually up to a certain limit. You know, they, they can approve a CapEx to replace a fridge or, you know, something else like that, something small. But we approve all CapEx. We also have um, 
by the way, let me check on before if we can publish how much of this can be published out. Um, I'll talk in generalities, maybe, and maybe not about the wallet, but I was talking about generalities on luxury hotels. In general, luxury hotels, if you're not operating it, you have a couple levers. One is the capex, controlling the capex up to a certain limit, um, you know, or over a certain limit, then you have, you have control of all that. But two, and this is the really big lever, is you approve the budget. So if the operator comes back to you and says, hey, we have this budget, and it looks like there's, you know, no profit in it for you or not enough profit for you as the owner of the hotel, you can, you can not approve the budget. And that matters a lot to the hotel because all their bonuses, everything, everything like that is tied to the budget. So they're, they're really heavily incentivized to have a budget. And also, if you don't have a budget in place, they have to come back to you for more approvals for a lot of things. So it makes everyone's life a little bit harder, but it does, it is a lever, a lever of, uh, it is a, a lever of control that, that you can pull as the owner. And then the last lever is we have veto rights typically for all the executive team at a hotel. So anytime, you know, so uh, a brand couldn't just hire a GM and put them in, they come, they, they interview them, they put them forth, maybe one or two candidates to us and they say, hey, we want to hire this candidate. And we can either veto it or not. We say, no, we don't want this candidate to bring us another one. Then usually there's some kind of like in politics, there's some usually check to that, which is, you know, if you veto three of our candidates, then we get to go back and pick one of those candidates and put it in because you can't just keep vetoing everyone. And then we have no GM for, you know, a year. But we get, a, we get as an owner, for even a third-party management, you'll typically have a veto right for not just the GM, but that'll often include, you know, director of sales, head of finance, potential chief engineer. It kind of depends on what you negotiate in that management agreement with the brand. But it's going to be, the three big ones are going to be veto rights for the executives, approval of budgets, and then ongoing kind of CapEx expenditure approvals. Those are the, so it kind of feels more like asset management instead of, you know, direct management. I guess, I guess the fourth one would be development, uh, additional capital injections, even adding amenities, those kind of things. Now that's going to be done in conjunction, though, with the brand. It still has to be approved. But those are things that typically the owner will um, and, and actually, sometimes it's iterative. Sometimes the, 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 the operator will come to us and say, hey, you know, we're noticing that this hotel down the street, you know, they just added a 5,000 square foot conference room and they're just killing us on group business. And every time we try to get a group, they say, hey, how much can you hold? We say 500 people and they say, hey, the hotel down the street can hold 1,000. We're going to bring our, you know, 50 night, you know, team over there and they're charging double that we're charging. You know, so something like that may come up and that has come up and they say, I, I really think we need to add something and then we'll discuss it and we'll add it. Um, that's a, that's, that's a little more of an iterative process though.